This is a video editorial of a problem from the July 2020 long challenge, Chef and Dragon Dens. In this problem, we're given n points separated by one unit each, with each point having a certain height denoted by the ith index of h and a value denoted by the ith index of a. If we were to plot the n points on a graph, with i on the x-axis and h i on the y-axis, and connect points i and i plus 1 for all i greater than or equal to 1 and less than n, the part underneath the figure formed touching the x-axis will be called the solid portion of our graph. Now let's define something called a move. We can move from point i to point j if the ith index of h is greater than the jth index of h. So if i is equal to 3 and j is equal to 4, we can move from 3 to 4 as h3 is greater than h4. However, we cannot move from 4 to 3, as h4 is less than h3. A move is also invalid if the line segment joining the two points i and j passes through the solid portion of our graph. For example, if i is equal to 5 and j is equal to 2, the line joining them passes through the solid portion, hence the move is invalid. A journey between two points can consist of one or more moves, as long as the direction of the moves remain constant. The value of a move is the sum of AIs of the cities we visit, or the values of the cities we visit, including the starting and ending cities. A valid journey from 5 to 2 would be from 5 to 3 and then from 3 to 2. However, a journey from 5 to 4 via node 3, which is from 5 to 3 and then from 3 to 4, is invalid as it changes direction by starting off by going leftwards and then going to the right. In our task, we're given two types of queries. The first type consists of two integers, b and k, which changes the value of a, b to k. So if our query of type 1 was 3 and 5, a3 would be become equal to 5. The second type of query consists of two integers, b and c. For queries of these types, we need to find the maximum value of a journey from b to c, or print minus 1 if such a journey does not exist. If b is equal to 5 and c is equal to 2, the maximum value of a journey from 5 to 2 would be from 5 to 3 and then from 3 to 2. This would give us a value of a5 plus a3 plus a2, which is equal to 16 plus 5 plus 2, which is equal to 23. Let's try and make some observations with a new set of points. If there exists some valid journey from i to k via j, and another path from i to k without going to j, it can be seen that it's always better to visit j during our journey, as all values of a are greater than zero, so visiting an extra valid city will never result in an answer that's worse off. An example in our graph would be the journey from 9 to 6 via point 8, which is better than a journey from 9 to 6 without visiting point 8. From this, we can conclude that if we have a valid journey, which includes some set of points, and removing a point also results in a valid journey, Removing it will never result in a better answer. Let's try and figure out a strategy for a journey from point A to point K. Let's look at it backwards. Let P be the nearest point to K in between the points A and K, from where we can reach K. The point P is always included in our journey, as there always exists a valid journey to P from all points where a valid journey to K exists. Adding the point P to all these journeys before adding point K would only increase the value of the journey as AI is greater than 0 for all i. Let's define RI as this point P for all i with paths coming from the right. This means that we need to find the minimum j such that j is greater than i and h of j is greater than h of i. This is a classic problem which can be implemented using a stack. Let's look at how this looks on our graph. R of 1 is equal to 3 as that's the closest index to its right with the height greater than 2. R of 2 is equal to 3. Similarly, R of 3 is equal to 4. We set R of 4 to 0 as there is no point to its right with a height greater than 8. We continue this in a similar manner. We know that we can travel from Ri to I. So again, let's look at this backwards. We can convert this into a directed tree with all edges pointing towards the root which means that we have directed edges from node i to node r of i. This tree has n edges from each of the n points, and n plus 1 nodes as the root is considered to be node 0. For a journey from i to j to be valid, we can see that i has to be an ancestor of j, 
which means that there exists a directed path from J to I. For example, there exists a valid journey from point 9 to point 5, as 9 is an ancestor of 5, and there exists a path from 5 to 9 in the tree. We can see that this also maximizes the value that we are meant to find as we visit the maximum number of possible points by repeatedly visiting our eyes from a given point, as discussed earlier. To confirm whether or not I is an ancestor of J, we can use binary lifting. However, if I is not an ancestor of J, it does not necessarily mean that there is no valid journey from I to J. Notice how we only checked for a valid path to I from the right of I. The opposite may also be true, where a valid path to I might come from its left. Hence, we need to repeat the process, calculating Li this time, where Li is the closest index to its left with a height greater than Hi. This can be solved in the same way, using a stack, following which we can build up another tree. Therefore, we need to check both trees before concluding that there is no valid journey from I to J. If neither of them have I as an ancestor of J, there are no valid journeys. I'll explain the solution on one tree for now, since the processes are identical on both trees. As of now, we can only confirm whether or not a valid journey from I to J exists. However, we need to find the maximum value of a journey. Note that we can solve this problem on our tree again. Let each node have a weight AI associated with it. A of 0 is equal to 0 since it's a dummy node. For a journey from I to J, we need to find the sum of weights from the path from I to J. Here's how it'd look for I is equal to 8 and J is equal to 5. The value is equal to 15. If we didn't have to deal with updates, this problem can be solved by calculating the sum of the nodes from the root to J minus the sum of the nodes from the root to I's parent. Visualizing this for i is equal to 8 and j is equal to 5 again, we can see that the sum of the root to j is 16, and the sum of the root to i's parent is 1. Hence, 16 minus 1 is equal to 15, which is the same as what we'd got earlier. To solve this problem efficiently, we need to make a further observation. Let's say that we are solving the problem of finding the value from the root to some node i. A node j will be included in this value only if i lies in its subtree. Thus, we can rethink this in terms of a flattened tree using pre-order traversal. Let t in of i equal to the time at which we enter a node and t out of i equal to the time at which we exit a node in this tree with reversed edges. This is how the process would look. From here, we can see that if your timer is greater than or equal to t in of i and less than or equal to t out of i, you're in the subtree of i. As an example, let's look at node 8. t in of 8 is equal to 3. t out of 8 is equal to 10. For each of the timer positions greater than or equal to 3 and less than or equal to 10, we can see that we would be in a node that is in the subtree of 8. We can visualize this as an array called R of length 2 times n now. If we add a of i to R of t in of i and minus a of i to R of t out of i plus 1, the sum from position 1 to position t in of i will give us the sum from the root to node i. This is how the array R will look.
It's easy to see that no node which hasn't been visited yet will have its value included in this path. Furthermore, nodes that have been visited but aren't ancestors of i will already have been exited. Hence, their value will have already been subtracted to cancel out when it had been added when we'd entered that node. On the other hand, ancestors of i have already been visited, so their values are added. However, we haven't left their subtree yet as node i is in all of its ancestors' subtrees. Hence, their values haven't been subtracted. Let's look at this with an example. Let's find the sum from the root to node 6. The sum from r of 1 to r of t in of i, which is r of 6, should be the sum from the root to node 6. Both 1 plus 3 plus 6 minus 2 and 1 plus 3 plus 4 is equal to 8. Now let's look at an ancestor of node 6, node 9. We can see that the value of node 9 gets added in our range, but it does not get cancelled out as that happens at index 12, which is out of our range. This is true for all ancestors as their t out values are greater than t in of 6. Now let's look at node 7, a node that has been visited and exited. While a of 7 does get added at index 4, it gets subtracted again at index 6, hence making the total contribution of node 7 in our range 0. Index 6 is 4 minus 6, which is minus 2. The 4 comes from t in of 6, while the minus 6 comes from t out of 7. Now let's look at node 5, a node which isn't visited at all on our path to node 6. As we can see, both t in of 5 and t out of 5 lies outside of our range, hence it won't contribute to the answer. Now let's consider how to deal with updates. Note that an update essentially just changes the value of a of i. So if we have to update the current value of a of i to x, its contribution to r of i changes by x minus a of i at two points, t in of i and t out of i plus 1. So we add x minus a of i to r of tin of i and subtract x minus a of i from r of t out of i plus 1. Following this, we update a of i to x. Now let's look at an example. If we update index 8 to 5, we need to update r of t in of 8 by adding 2 to it and subtracting 2 from r of t out of 8 plus 1. Following this, we update a of 8 to 5. This problem can now easily be solved using a sum segment tree of this array with point updates. For updates where we update index i to x, we first update position t of in of i in our segment tree by adding x minus a of i to it and updating position t out of i plus 1 by subtracting x minus a of i from it, following which we directly update a of i to x. For queries of the other type, after confirming that node i is an ancestor of node j, the answer is query 1 comma j minus query 1 comma parent of i, where query a comma b is the sum of r values from a to b. Remember that in our original problem, we'd created two trees, so we have to maintain two segment trees and we have to decide which one we query based on which tree has i as an ancestor of j. However, for updates we update both segment trees. The complexity is O of n plus q log n. The n log n part comes from the binary lifting in the initial segment tree updates. The q log n part comes from the fact that each query which involves a segment tree update or query will require O of log n time. Furthermore, checking whether a node is an ancestor of another node will take log of n time too. Before I start explaining the implementation, I'll explain the subtasks really quickly. Subtask 1 has q, n less than or equal to 1000. This can easily be solved in O of qn by starting from the endpoint of a journey for each query and first scanning leftwards for the next point with a height greater than it repeatedly till we reach the node we start from, then we do this a second time but rightwards instead. If the starting node is reached in any of these, we have an answer. Subtask 2 doesn't have queries of the first type, so there aren't any updates. After building our trees, we don't need to maintain segment trees. Instead, we can calculate a dp, where dp of car is equal to dp of the parent of car plus a of car. The answer for all queries will then be dp of j minus dp of i's parent. This is still O of q plus n log n, as we need to do binary lifting to figure out whether i is an ancestor of j. I'll be showing snippets of my implementation as it'll make it easier to understand my code. A link to my submission is in the description below. This is a snippet in which we build the first tree and find the closest value to the right with a height greater than the current height. The stack consists of candidate points which might have a height greater than the current height. As a result, in line 1, we add n to the stack. 
Line 2 adds an edge between 0 and n as there are no points to the right of n. We have to keep popping from the stack while the height at the top of the stack is less than or equal to the current height. If this results in an empty stack, there are no points to the right of i with a height greater than it, hence we attach it to the node 0. Otherwise, the index at the top of the stack is the closest node with a height greater than the current node, so we add an edge between the two indices. Finally, we push the current index to the stack as a candidate point. Out here, I directly build the tree without storing li or ri separately as explained in the video. The other tree is built in the exact same way. We only traverse the array in the opposite direction this time. Now let's look at our DFS function for our first tree. Count is a timer which increments every time we enter or exit a node. So we can update t in and t out at the start of the function when we enter the node and at the end of the function where we exit the node. Depth just stores the current depth of the node in our DFS. dp of car of 0 stores the 2 to the power of 0th ancestor of the current node, which happens to be the node's parent. We use this for binary lifting. DFS2 works in the exact same way, but just for the second tree. For checking whether a node's an ancestor of another node, we can make use of the following function. If our target ancestor's depth is greater than our current node, we know that it can't be an ancestor of our node. If the nodes are the same, we return true. Otherwise, we keep traveling upwards from the lower node to the target ancestor node in lengths of decreasing powers of 2. dp of i of j points to the 2 to the power of jth ancestor of node i. Once the depths are the same, if they're the same nodes, we can conclude that the target node was an ancestor. dp of i of j is implemented using binary lifting where we note that 2 to the power of j is equal to 2 times 2 to the power of j minus 1. Therefore, if we know dp values for all nodes for a certain 2 to the power of j, we can use it to calculate the dp values for all nodes for 2 to the power of j plus 1. For more details, I'll include a binary lifting tutorial in the description below. Note that we'd initially calculated all values of dp of i of 0 during our DFS. Hence, we can use them to build the rest of the array. It would be helpful to know that it is also possible to check whether a node is an ancestor of another node without using binary lifting. If node a is an ancestor of node b, t in of a is less than equal to t in of b, and t out of b is less than equal to t out of a. Thus, if we have the pre-calculated values of t in and t out, we can check for ancestors in o of one time. This is just a standard point update sum segment tree. I won't go into details of how it works. I'll leave a tutorial on segment trees in the description below. As you can see, queries of type 1 are implemented exactly the way I described earlier. If we need to update point node to val, we update the difference between the current value of the node and the updated value and pass it on to both segment trees at the appropriate points as described before. Queries of the second type are implemented as shown. We check both trees to check if one of the nodes is an ancestor of the other. Note that the order matters. In this case, if we need to check if we can travel from B to A, B needs to be an ancestor of A. Accordingly, we can figure out if an answer exists or not. If it does, we query the appropriate segment tree as explained in the video earlier. Instead of implementing it by querying B's parent, we query the path from the root to B instead and subtract the value and then add back B, as it will obviously be in our path. With that, we come to the end of this animated editorial. I'll add links to relevant tutorials which will be helpful for this problem in the description below. All animations were written in Python using 3Blue1Brown's library, Manim. Thanks for watching.